Dr. Santosh, thank you once again for coming on to our regular interaction with uh, prospective civil uh, um, servants who want to learn uh, to become better leaders in this country. And who better than you to come and lead us the way with 26 years of experience as an IAS officer serving multiple positions. On behalf of everyone, thank you so much. Thank you, Kripa. Pleasure joining all of you. So over the last one week, uh, we have collated uh, questions from participants um, who are eager to learn. And we use those questions as an opportunity to, to ask you during these AMA sessions. And for the benefit of everyone who's watching it live as well as the recorded version, um, every Sunday between 2 p.m. and 3 p.m., uh, Dr. Santosh will come and answer each of your questions. So feel free to ask your questions via Facebook, via Twitter, via LinkedIn, via Telegram, and WhatsApp. Uh, the first question, Dr. Santosh, is your favorite subject, uh, PubAd or public administration. How important it is and why should people really focus? Now, uh, for this question to be answered, I think you should allow me to share a screen. Uh, if you can permit me, uh, uh, I can share just one slide. That should be good enough. Yes. Yes, Dr. Santosh. Okay. I'll just go and one second. Um, are you in a position to see the screen? Yes, Dr. Santosh. Yeah. So your question was about uh, public administration, uh, why it should be an optional, why should students choose it? In fact, um, it said that statistically speaking, around 10% of the students who attempt a civil service examination, that's a means, uh, take around, uh, take 10% 10, 10 of the students take, uh, candidates take public administration and be roughly between 10% for political science, around 8% for sociology, that kind of thing. So around 10%. And a, lo a lot of them qualify, uh, even though, you know, in different years, there are different statistical things and there's a herd mentality and people go after one option or the other. But PubBad is such a tailor-made option for civil service aspirants. The reasons are very simple. I'll explain this one single slide. Uh, in the preliminary general studies uh, questions, an average of around 15 uh, questions out of 100, that's 15 percentage, comes from polity and governance. And as you, can, as you know, paper two, public administration is all about polity and governance, mostly 99% about polity and governance. So 15 out of one. So the advantage here is that anyways, uh, you are studying polity and governance as part of general studies also. So it will ease your preparation of general, for the general studies as well as help you prepare for you, your optional. So when you take up the optional, you know, generally people start uh, reading uh, or studying public uh, general studies first. And when you start taking your optional, if it matches with what you already learned in general studies, it makes life much more easier, right? So in that sense, for general studies, limbs, uh, 15 out of 100 questions come from this. A lot of questions, you know, if I remember uh, the role of the chief secretary, all of this are part of the paper two of uh, public administration. In any case, you'll be studying it as part of quality, right? That's one. Second is general studies mains paper. Paper one, modern India has its base in Indian administration. So if you look at the entire Indian administration, right, right from constitution uh, to the prime minister's office, to the president's office, to judiciary, to the legislative, to the CM's office, the chief secretary, you name it, the entire modern India uh, uh, comes from Indian administration, which is part of paper one, right? Now go to paper two. Polity and governance comes in that. Indian administration, again, paper two uh, covers that. So, and paper three, internal security and disaster management is a complete chapter in paper uh, two of public administration, right? So it's a complete chapter. So paper three of general studies mains is covered in that. And paper four, ethics, mostly the uh, uh, questions come from public administration. What if you're a district collector? You know, if you're faced with this situation, what will you do, et cetera, et cetera. These are the kinds of questions that come in ethics about integrity. You know, most of it's covered in any case in, um, you know, paper one and paper two in any case. So paper one of Indian, uh, sorry, of public administration is about theories of admin, uh, public administration. There are around 20, 21 thinkers 
whom we need to study. And very simple. It's not at all complicated. The theories are very, very simple. And you'll always know that one theory is debunked by the next thinker, and the next thinker's theory is debunked by the next thinker. It's very interesting the way it's weaved together. And the way I teach, it's in a very, very logical fashion. So I don't go by the syllabus exactly. I'll go one, two, three chapters, then I'll go to six chapter, then I'll go to eight chapter. I may come back to fourth, that kind of thing, because it needs a logical way of teaching. So paper four is ethics. Essay papers, you know, at least two topics come from, come from public administration. These are based on, uh, you know, studies. So at least two cop topics come from public administration. Um, you know, uh, examples uh, would be, uh, what about the dowry system in India? You know, then, uh, you know, it uh, directly is uh, dealt with in the women and development part of paper two of public administration. And it's there in paper one also. Then interview. Interview is all about public administration, right? They will ask questions, very hypothetical questions. What if you are uh, a secretary uh, and you're dealing with this pandemic? What will be your reaction, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, the study of public administration, paper one and paper two, will actually prepare you for this, this interview part, portion. Not that, you know, other uh, optionals don't prepare for you, you for this. But the point I'm trying to make it is it makes life very easier. And when you go to uh, Labasna, which is Lal Bahadur Shastri National Academy of Administration, uh, there are public administration classes and where examinations to be done. And when you become an IAS officer, your entire work is about public administration. So if you look at the entire journey of, public, uh, of a civil service aspirant, right from the prelims to becoming an IAS officer, uh, the PubBad will be guiding, will be a guiding force. In fact, uh, the Baswan committee, Mr. Baswan IAS was my director when I was in the academy for the say, phase two, sorry, phase three. And uh, we know him very well. He uh, was asked to uh, give his report. There are a large number of committees which have gone into public administration, sorry, uh, into civil service examination, how it should be held, et cetera. Based on these committees only, you know, at some point they introduced the CSAT, at some point they introduced the uh, ethics, some point they introduced essay, et cetera. So all these committees have their relevance. So Baswan committee recommended and it is not out yet, but we know it from internal sources, that uh, there should not be any optionals at all. What he's saying is, if at all, it should be uh, law and uh, public administration, because these are what, uh, and it makes a level playing field. See, somebody who takes mathematics, for instance, somebody who's an IIT topper, it becomes child's play for him to get that 100 out of 100. It, uh, there might be a genius out there who will get a full marks. Now, for a pub bad student or for a sociology student, or anthropology student, law student to catch up will be extremely difficult. So what they do is they kind of, uh, you know, rationalize the answers and kind of arrive at an average. You know, it's very difficult to do whatever formula you apply. So I have always been thinking why we don't have a common examination, common subjects for all students, and then be judged accordingly. So law is required because you're going to implement rule of law. And um, public administration is uh, there because you are every day doing public administration. So if you know the theories well, and you know the thinkers well, and you know how these theories have been applied over the years, your life becomes extremely easy. So I think this one slide should be good enough to lure people into a public administration's choice. Kirba. Excellent. Thank you for that, uh, Dr. Santosh. This leads us to another fundamental question. How did public administration evolve? Um, you've, done, um, you've done focus studies of this at Kennedy School of, um, at, at Harvard University, you've gone to NUS. Um, so sh you know, give us an insight as to how did it evolve and, uh, and why people should take this more seriously. How do I close this? Um, okay, so, um, See, um, you know, the uh, evolution of man into uh, from Neanderthal, etc., I think it's around 2.4 billion years. But if you ask uh, the person who wrote the book called um, um, Zapiens, Sapiens by Harari, he would say, um, you know, the cognitive revolution happened around 70,000 years ago. Uh, the agriculture revolution happened around 20, 10 to 20,000 years ago. And the technological revolution happened around 500 years back. So this is the evolution of man. But right from day one, uh, man was in a group. That is husband, wife, or you know, two uh, man and woman and a couple of children. But they would be going around in small groups because they were afraid of nature. 
and they were afraid of the elements of nature and they were afraid of the animals and we are talking about animals means what jurassic park animals so the big animals so they had to take care of themselves so if you look at it uh, they were organized in a uh, in a some sense as a family as a unit and today even today uh, the family is a unit of organization if you look at all organizations across the world we are impinged as it were on a everyday basis by government or private sector or by ngo sector or by clubs or by voluntary organization you name it all these organize it's only organizations that impinge us very few individuals actually impinge us the way organizations does so at that point of time they had to take care of themselves and they were moving around it is a very egalitarian society right because they were not uh, there was no concept of private property at some point uh, at those points in time so they were moving around so that they are safe etc but Once, once you know, around three thousand years back, they discovered iron, and they realized that you know we can handle animals and etc., enemies etc. with the um, uh, weapons made out of it. They actually got stuck to land, so they decided that we'll stay at some place, start agriculture etc., and do it. But at the same time, what happened at this point of time? Till now, it is an egalitarian society. Now people started developing interest in land. So some people occupied more acres, acres of land. Some people occupied less acres. So what happened at this point of time was. that uh, a man it became a feudal system where some became land owners or landlords and some became landless laborers so these are the two sections of population that existed this is these were the only two factors of um, uh, development fact factors of uh, 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 fa fa these are only two factors that existed at the point of time right so at that point of time now they needed control so they needed control uh, because you know some uh, people are landlords and some people are Uh, landless laborers and over a period of time these guys who went on to occupy more and more pieces of land and they became kings and over a period of time they wanted to become emperors so they started empire building so what these two people did at that point of time were only two things one is maintain law and order and you know the administration was what is called the spoil system because they put their relatives everything in the vantage points because it is based on trust now um uh um, what was i telling so it became the kings became attached to uh, kings and uh, emperors wanted to control the people so they did only two basic functions which is maintenance of law and order internal and external and second one is collection of revenue so who are produce whatever i'll take 16 or 26 and so that i keep my army and my team ready fighting fit etc so this was the scope of public administration maybe 5000 years back even uh, beyond so the scope of public administration is very limited there was no concept of welfare and the king never cared about people because people never selected him in the first place or elected him they themselves anointed themselves and became kings etc but over a period of time and if you see the industrial revolution industrial revolution was around uh, 1740 1760 etc those points at that point, particular point of time what was happening was we had a monarchical system across the world so monarchies actually wanted to keep people happy not that they want they wanted to rule over them but they didn't want any dispiritedness or revolt from the people so they will ensure that things are taken care of etc but uh, you know because of industrial revolution there was a lot of activity happening in the sense of economy started expanding and a lot of money was coming in taxes were being paid but it is not it is not uh, you know given back to the society in a sense and people started questioning them so at that's the point of time when man revolted and that's when the french revolution the american revolution they all happened right so now what happened was that it uh, spawned the evolution of what's called democracy so democracy at the one point and the spoil system of administration they didn't have what's called the bureaucracy at that point of time they had spoil system means that is my wife my son my sister all will be my coterie who will be part of uh, the government and this uh, industrial revolution what happened was industrial revolution uh, cannot keep pace or a spoil system cannot keep pace with industrial revolution because industrial revolution is talking about quality and here what you have we don't have people who are selected through a common examination right so that's the time they realized that the democracy cannot go ahead with a spoil system democracy can go ahead only with something called a bureaucracy which weber invented weber said that people uh, people should be scientifically selected scientifically trained scientifically placed and they should be what is called the value neutrality or political neutrality etc they should be working with blinkered eyes and uh, the only the politician who will have what is called facts and values will decide the policy and you shall implement these policies with rules and uh, regulations so man the 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 bureaucrat became what is called a machine so from uh, monarchy 
the, where, where we had feudalism to democracy we have, where we had um, um, uh, to, to capitalism. So capital, so the factors of production became, uh, the landlords became what? Capitalists. The uh, land, landless laborer became the worker. So capitalists and workers came to dominate society. And now more and more production is happening. The scope of public administration is increasing. Everyday things that you took for granted as uh, part of your life now became regulated by government. Go government had to come in uh, big time. And today you see, it's not only government. In the publicness of public government, the public administration is basically meant to say government. But today what we say is anything done in the welfare of humankind under the ambit of law is public administration. It can be government, can be private sector, it can be multilateral organization, it can be the World Bank, it can be a multinational organization, it can be NGOs, it can be civil society organization, it can be media, it can be anybody who does anything within the scope of rule of law becomes public administration. So this is the breadth from very narrow law and order to from and, and revenue collection to what we see today. Every minute, the moment you get into the bus, that's a regulation again. You know, government has established that or private sector. There is a, then the moment you get in an auto rickshaw, that is also regulated. Everything is public administration. So the scope is wide in a sense. That's why Waldo said, don't define public administration because the scope is expanding by the minute. Now, if you want to go to Mars also, you have to go through the ambit of public administration because a government only can decide that, right? So that's why this public administration is so, so important. It um, regulates our life from morning till evening, knowingly or knowingly. You are regulated. And um, um, uh, the, the, the few bureau bureaucrats that are selected through the civil service examination actually controls this. That's why PubBad as a practice and as a discipline is extremely intriguing and interesting. Sorry for that long answer. No, but beautifully elucidated. Thank you for that, Dr. Santosh. Yeah. Um, so here's a question from a parent um, who has uh, young children. Uh, he says that for IITs, you know, right from almost six standard onwards, there are courses that helps the students get trained uh, for uh, IIT JE. Uh, similarly, for medical, uh, why is there no such early guidance program for school children and seeding the thought in their mind that civil services is an excellent career option to take? Uh, <laughs> interesting question. Um, you see, while I was in school, there was this young, uh, you know, there was a classmate of mine. He was a junior of mine. He was, I was probably in the seventh standard he was in sixth standard so every time he'll be talking only about civil service but in the entire school and i studied in a kendri vidyalaya nobody ever talked about ias or ips so even today i am told it doesn't happen except even in this career uh, orient the career uh, you know um, what, do you, what do you call that program career orientation program uh, nobody talks about the civil service it's seen as something which is very unattainable or i don't know because people who are uh, actually you know uh, doing those career guidance, etc., have no idea. So I think it's a very interesting thing. And in Capstone IS Academy, we are seriously thinking of conducting such programs in schools, etc., to generate some interest. But the point is um, that you know uh, the people who I keep saying this: people who do quizzing, people who do debating, people people who are interested in speaking on stage, etc., actually go on to become uh, write the civil service examination and get this into the civil service. So if it is done with a lot of mentoring, like you said, I think it will be very useful because people approach this exam in a in a way as if you oh, know oh, it's not it's an impossible thing. It's meant for only greater mortals. That is not the case. I think there is a case for starting this kind of career orientation. The other problem is that how many students will you take? You know, ultimately, only around 160 people or out of the 15 lakh people, right? Only around 800 to 900 people get into the civil service. So as a career option, it, it's kind of uh, stymied at that level itself. Uh, you know, unless you are the really the best, you can't really get in. So whereas if you're a doctor or engineer, the numbers are huge. So that's possibly the reason. I really don't know why it's not there. Uh, we all got to know through uh, the, because of competition success review or my father was, you know, friendly with an IS officer, etc. Otherwise, uh, even today, even today, lots of youngsters don't even have this in their horizon. In their, even the limited, uh, in a farthest horizon, this is not there because all of them think it's a difficult thing because it's a difficult examination, the mother of all examinations, uh, difficult because the fact that the number of seats entry is very limited. 
compared to the number of if there are 1000 seats five years yes they will have you know during my time it was only 80 now it's around 160 maybe it will increase to 200 but i don't see it increasing beyond that and i don't think more than 1000 seats will be required every year but there is a gap in the civil service right now i'm told there is 1381 seats vacant in the ias itself every year year on year so obviously there might be an increase in the next few years so there is a chance for a more, lot more people to get in. But I don't see it jumping beyond 250 or max 300, that kind of thing. Right? So this could be possibly the reason. But uh, uh, I think a lot of IAS academies have now sprung up here and there, including us. And uh, it's giving a lot of uh, information on social media. Right now, social media is our biggest reach. And I'm seeing young parents call up. You know, my son is in the fourth channel. How do I train him, etc. I've got a couple of calls like that. But the point is that if parents are interested, the first thing they should uh, make the child understand is the reading habit. Unless they get into the reading habit, it's difficult because you can't build up the reading habit overnight. It has to be built up from the first standard, second standard onwards, reading newspapers, reading uh, fiction, um, getting your uh, diction very good, uh, getting your vocabulary inside because then uh, once your vocabulary is inside, it becomes easier to you know, capture the vocabulary of the subjects itself. For example, I keep saying public administration has a peculiar vocabulary. Unless you capture those and then write it in your words, it will not convey the essence of the answer. So uh, I have no idea why it's done, not done. Uh, maybe because these are the reasons. Thank you for that, Dr. Santosh. Yeah. Um, could I request you to um, close this presentation? Yeah, how do I do that? Red, That's what I'm The red saying. color button at the bottom. Uh, no, I am. Uh, one second. Has it gone? Yeah. Yes. Yes, it's gone. Okay, Thank right. you. Um, you mentioned that IAS exam is one of the one of the most difficult ones, but the good news is that um, Capstone IAS Academy has tied up with Exelon to mimic the real test series. So this helps students. The more exam they take and attempt um, test preparation series, the better it becomes when they go on to attempt the real exam. Talk us through that and why did you choose to tie up with an artificial intelligence based testing mechanism? So Exelon um, is, uh, is a company based out of uh, IIT Research Park Madras. So it's mentored out of that uh, institution. So it has that quality. One is that. Second is the CEO of the company, Mr. Uday is a personal friend of mine. I know him. He has been teaching in some IAS academies for a long time. Um, third is the fact that, you know, they have around 10,000 questions uh, which are there in the in the question bank and they're keeping adding to it. And these are questions which have been asked in many years in the previous, uh, uh, since uh, many years. So uh, the, the advantage here is, uh, see, we are studying all kinds of stuff. Anything under the sun is uh, uh, is part of the civil service examination, especially the prelims, preliminary examination. So, um, you know, uh, so there's a part of geography, there's some of history, civics, mathematics, you name it, all the subjects that we study from 6th standard, 12th standard in NCR to come. Sir. A little metadata would be useful in uh, finding out. But, you know, the preparation, you might be very good at mathematics and uh, you will prepare well there. Whereas your preparation on, let's say, geography might be weak. Now, who tells you uh, uh, that you are weak in these areas? Is it possible to get that kind of <coughs> evidence-based uh, information? So that's what uh, Exelon is all about. Exelon question series is based on an algorithm which tells you that you are good in this area, but maybe you are taking a lot more time trying to answer this. You're taking this much time for this question, which shows that you're not sure about the answer. And it will kind of program itself to say that you are good in these areas, you're weak in these areas, you are medium in these areas, et cetera, where you need improvement, et cetera. So that's the advantage of Exelon uh, test series. Uh, we are tied up with them precisely for this reason, because uh, I was always thinking that we should have something like this. And I jumped at it the moment uh, I came to know about it. So, and uh, they are improving as we speak. Every day their team is working on this. And we are also supplying them with a large number of questions to add to their repertoire. Thank you, Dr. Santosh. Um, a follow-up question to that is, um, uh, there are lots of courses from IAS academies that focuses on subjects. You mentioned public administration as one, but are there training programs available 
on softer side, which is on the how can students focus, how can students increase their uh, their retention, their attention, is that also covered in the course curriculum? No, that's a, that's a very interesting question. But um, you know that uh, requires specialists who are good at this. You know, we teach only subjects as of now. Uh, there's uh, nothing to substantiate what you asked. We don't have that, but we can think about it. Some teachers might be good at this, you know, speed reading and stuff like that, how retention, et cetera. Uh, but this is in the realm of a uh, little of psychology. Uh, so I don't have an answer to that right now because we have not experimented with it so far. But since you have raised this question, uh, we'll sit together and find out if there's possibility that we can train students on the way that you would uh, want your students to be trained, uh, retention, memory, uh, speed reading, and stuff like that. Thank you for that, uh, Dr. Santosh. Our next question is, um, is an extension of uh, what you just answered, which is uh, how important is critical thinking ability uh, for a student attempting to write the UPSC exam? Very, very interest, uh, interesting question. Uh, because, you know, uh, see, you read the newspapers and you can uh, straight away say, okay, today's uh, Hindu says in the first page that um, uh, UP cabinet is going to be expanded. Now, that's uh, reading straight. Now, you should also be able to read between the lines in the sense, uh, what is uh, a cabinet? How is it expanded? To what length can be expanded? These are nuances or metadata which is not available in the newspapers. So that's the time uh, you will dwell into your polity paper and want to have a little more look at it. Because you know these provide the pointers to questions that may come. But you need a lot more nuanced uh, reading of that particular subject. So uh, if I were a candidate right now, what I will do, read the newspaper, points, take, take points, and then read a little more metadata out of it. Because uh, the newspapers don't carry that kind of thing. So that's where uh, more detailing is, has to happen for a small point. Uh, see, for example, Ras Ramsar uh, uh, regions, what are they? No, that will be mentioned only as that in the newspaper, but you need to take it up and find out what are the Ramsar regions and uh, wildlife areas in India, what is it means, what it means to animals and what it means to ecology, etc. So when you kind of develop this critical reading habit, it becomes second nature. So for the civil servant, uh, for the person who is preparing for civil service, metadata and reading between the lines is most critical. Thank you, Dr. Santosh. Uh, the next question is an interesting one. Um, and the question goes like this, Dr. Santosh, um, you are an inspiration to many aspiring IAS officers. Which IAS officers have inspired you? And what qualities in them did you admire the most? So, not very difficult. But there's one IAS officer in Kerala, was the Chief Secretary of Kerala, Mr. Vijayanand. Um, his simplicity, his honesty, his attention to detail, um, his uh, uh, ability to make teams out of very ordinary people and in, in, increase the capacity to deliver. These are some of the things, but honesty has always inspired me. If somebody is very brilliant, but is not honest, has never inspired me. But I see lots of officers like that, you know, because the opportunity to compromise in the service is very high. So if, uh, you know, what they say in uh, public administration, um, the definition for uh, leadership is called moral responsibility. The uh, definition for leadership is called, that's uh, Waldo, no, Chester Bernard has given this definition. He says that uh, when you are swarmed with so many things when you're a bureaucrat and still you don't use it for your personal purposes, that is moral responsibility. When you have the ability to exploit, you know, for example, a vehicle, the uh, punes, uh, you know, so much is available for you at your disposal and your ability to withstand those temptations to misuse that is called moral responsibility. So I've always admired people with moral responsibility and uh, Vijayan sir is one. Um, there are many officers, uh, but then I, my standards are pretty high and it, stands, it starts with basically uh, complete integrity. Uh, so that's one. Uh, second is the ability to innovate and the leadership skills. See, for example, um, 
Mr. Shailendra Babu, who is the BGP of Tamil Nadu. Uh, uh, I was um, uh, I was a sub collector, and uh, he was my SP. And there was a huge law and order issue following the murder of a person right in front of my office. And I had given him this information. This person had come, and uh, somehow he got hacked to death. And there was a huge law and order problem. And you know, at the in front of the mortuary is that two three days of um, unrest in Chidambara that is happening and uh, you know i'm standing the space here a uh, whole portion of policemen are here behind and in front of the mortuary and you know people come to uh, uh, come drunk and you know they will come before the sp they he, he was doing all kinds of things almost touching him you know who are you you know using bad language uh, extremely vulgar you know and the policeman standing on both sides and i was very angry i said so you what do you do? You, why can't you stop him? But you know, Mr. Shailendra Babu looked straight ahead. He had a cooling glass on. In absolutely inscrutable. I was fascinated with that. Till today, it's, uh, you know, it sticks to my mind that you know he could have just picked him up and thrown him out. That's as simple as that. Or the policeman, you could have asked them to just pick him up. He just didn't escalate the situation because it is already a tough crisis. So that kind of leadership is amazing. Uh, uh, that I have admire in him. I mean, that portion I don't know about his other things but i would say that you know that kind of personality which is calmness maintaining calm at the height of uh, violence at the height of unrest etc is amazing um then uh, uh, then mr harshmanda who was our uh, deputy director in academy he's of course quit the service he was an extremely inspiring person a very honest down to earth uh, etc so so see, these are some of the people and um, you know uh, a lot of youngsters also inspire me. A lot of, not only IAS officers, there are so many people, you know, you look at Dr. Kalam or you look at uh, very ordinary people also. You know, for example, uh, you look at the list that has come out recently. There are many young people who didn't have the circumstances and they came into service. They also inspire. How is it that, what fired them up? You know, these are things which keep inspiring people. Uh, yeah, but outstanding officers with high integrity are few and far between. That's my point. Thank you, Dr. Santosh. Uh, the minute we hear of an IAS officer, there is almost an instant evocation of respect. And the reason is because the person has gone through rigorous training, rigorous selection, uh, has to pass one of the toughest exams, and then comes on board to, do, to serve the country. If, if an IAS officer has to go through so much hurdles to pass through the highest uh, benchmark, uh, why should not politicians be subject to the rigorous selection? Won't mm -hmm. India as a country be fantastic if that is implemented? Absolutely. Uh, but then that's the way the constitution has designed it. Um, there are, uh, while there are selection processes, uh, uh, for the for the bureaucrat, there's no selection process for the uh, politician. He just needs to be 25 years of age if he was, wants to become an MLA. Uh, education is not a... But then you see, uh, you know, Kamraj was not an educated person, highly educated person. He was one of the most honest persons. And what you see in Tamil Nadu today, uh, the all, all the infrastructure uh, is because of him. So it has nothing to do with this, uh, you know, wanting to serve the country, uh, it can be an uneducated person or an educated person. It's the, how do we say it? It's the it's upbringing, it's education, it's experience, and uh, the feelings that you uh, feel for your people, country people. Uh, that will make you uh, clean. Even very highly educated officers becoming corrupt, isn't it? So, so there's no real one answer for it. All I can say is that um, people... People should not elect such people. That's all. If uh, somebody is perceived to be corrupt, or he's, um, you know, he's, uh, he's got really his uh, personal self to be taken care of, I think people should not elect. But the position today is, you know, I stood for elections, and I'm, you know, recently met a Supreme Court lawyer who deals with FDI and stuff like that, um, and he deals in crores. Uh, he he told me straight, sir, I didn't vote for you in the you, I, was, I was a well cherry candidate because the other guy gave me biryani. I was shocked. Now I can understand a, a very ordinary person talking like that. 
But this is the level of discourse in the country that you can be lured by biryani or you can be lured by money. So it's ultimately the people who needs to change. It's not the, even if you put the best selection system, very bad people can come in. Uh, generally what they say in public administrations also, it says that, you know, the bureaucrat and the politician don't have public uh, interest in mind. It's called self-aggrandizing bureaucrats and vote-seeking, bar rent-seeking, bar bribe-seeking politicians. So this is the way it's described. But having said that, we also need checks and balances. So far it has worked well, but then, then uh, you know, uh, not having visionary leaders is always a problem. It need not be an educated leader, but we need a visionary one. Two, uh, is somebody who doesn't want to dip into the system. So they, they, need, to, they need to have uh, one method of income, a stream of income to sustain himself. Uh, that's very, very important. Um, having said that, I don't think it will ever be implemented in the country uh, because it's then uh, reducing the choices. Uh, maybe you could bring education qualification as a... But today, education is also up for sale. Somebody can get a PhD also by paying up. So uh, the point is that uh, strict punishments should be given to people, uh, whether they're bureaucrats or politicians or anybody in power if they misuse the resources of the country. Very strict punishments. China does it very effectively. They do demonstration punishments. We don't. We, we, we are not seeing many politicians convicted, nor bureaucrats convicted. We scratch each other's backs and we get away. Um, so my answer would be that ultimately people have to choose the best uh, because that's democracy. A sense of democracy is, okay, you even put a, the biggest, worst guy, but we will not elect him. We'll elect the best person. And these are the qualities that we look in them. We need to undergo a perception change among, because we are, see the problem with politics is that we're all looking at why should I waste my vote? Let me give it to the winning candidate. And in his own perception, this is a winning candidate, that's a winning candidate. They will not be given to a person who is, uh, who, if given a choice, can transform. See, for example, I was telling the military people that give me a chance, I will transform military as better than Singapore and show you. And it's very easy to do. I told them, but only 24,000 people voted for me. Thank you, Dr. Santosh. Um, the next part of it is, um, you know, the group interview, uh, the interview process is an important part of uh, the selection process. So the question is, what do panelists analyze after the interview? So um, if you're a serious candidate or not is checked uh, in the prelims examination, then the knowledge is checked in the mains examination. And the interview is only about personality. You know, you know, some people come and really fight in the interview and they know that this person is not suitable. So they'll not give marks. But again, it's very subjective, as you say, uh, because, you know, these are retired bureaucrats, there are scientists, there are all kinds of people inside that uh, five member or six member interview board. But, uh, you know, when you spend uh, 30, 40 minutes with a person, you get a hang of his personality, right? It's not so much from the knowledge point of view uh, that it's tested. It's more from the response point of view, the approach. Uh, What's the approach that's being taken uh, by the candidate? Uh, is he, does he have extremes views? Right? Does he have extreme rights view, rightist view, or leftist view, or centrist view? Is he a balanced person? So one is whether he's a balanced person, whether he's calm in crisis, uh, whether he can be perturbed with a difficult question. You know, these are things which uh, give us an idea about the personality. You know, for example, I was, uh, um, the, so under Capstone IAS Academy, we did the interview for four candidates. Uh, and to one candidate, I said, um, and this is a recording, I will be putting it on Facebook also, that I'll be very surprised if you don't get in the top 10. And uh, she came sixth, uh, her name is Mira. And she came, so that's an instinctive feel that this candidate is outstanding from various points of view. Basically, we're looking for a rounded person. We are not looking for an extremely brilliant personality. You know, then you can take nerds, you can take a space scientist, but if he doesn't have a feel for the country, uh, doesn't have uh, empathy for poor people, you know, these are things, empathy for poor people, rounded personality, ability to manage, all kinds of uh, things. Those are the kinds of things that the board is looking for. Basically calm, cool, 
smart people, youngsters. Thank you, Dr. Santosh. So here's a question some, uh, from someone who has been following you for a long time. <clears throat> and he states that, um, you know, language is an expression of human thought. Um, you have the ability to communicate very clearly. How can students um, learn how to be articulate and to transfer what is in their mind uh, so that the listeners can grasp clearly what they are saying? Yeah. Uh, so in communication, there are two things. One is language. Second is um, the ideas. You know, uh, so very good English, you know, a convent, uh, convent school student can speak extremely good English compared to, let's say, a candidate who is entering into the interview board. Uh, but, you know, the personality, the person is not tested by uh, language alone. Language is, of course, a very important thing. Uh, for improving language, I keep saying this, that, uh, you know, you should have learned language. There's no doubt about that. You are from your first standard. If English is a difficult thing, UPSC gives you an option to study or be in your, speak in your regional language. So even I found people in regional language also stuttering and stammering. So if you're not given importance to language learning in your school and college, that's a problem you have to tackle. But how do you improve it? Is One is by reading, reading newspapers, reading books, reading fiction. The other is, uh, one of the things that I used to do as a child is, I used to listen to BBC radio. And even today I do that. So BBC radio actually gives you uh, not only news coverage across the world, but it gives you vocabulary that you generally don't uh, encounter in your newspapers, etc. Uh, so any attempt made to improve your language, and Kriba, you are one of the best speakers I've seen in town, um, you would have you would have improved on it. You would have noticed that you need to speak on stage. So every time you try to improve. So people who, sometimes I get irritated because, you know, they have not made an attempt to improve the English language. And they take the interview in English and the uh, questions in English. That's not correct. If you are not good in English, take your region language. There's no problem. There's a scribe. There'll be people to translate it for the board. Your personality is not tested on language alone. There are many people I know of my batchmate, Kunjita Almina, who speaks only Hindi. A good officer, outstanding officer. So don't not worry about language, but if you're taking it in English, please ensure that you read a lot, you listen to BBC, listen to NDTV. Uh, reading habit will give you the vocabulary. So the mind, the brain will go and pick it up from there. Synapses will open up for you. If you have not read and you're going to start only now, it's not going to help. So I would advise parents to instill the reading habit. So British library, the British library here in Chennai or any place, put them into libraries, ask them to go to libraries. You know, this reading on the phone, on the net, etc. Uh, has a lot of negatives because, you know, the, 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 it, 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 I call it the problem of the uh, hyper, uh, hyper, what is it called? Hyper, uh, you know, you, there's an underline and you can click and then goes hyper, hyperlink. So there's a, I call it a hyperlink syndrome. That is, you click, 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 it will go. So the idea of the civil service is not to learn too much of one thing, is learn many things about many things. So don't read on the net unless it's absolutely warranted, but read the books, newspaper, everything physically. That will stand you in good stead. Thank you, Dr. Santosh. Um, I want to, uh, to narrate an incident and then I have a follow-up question based on that incident. Um, I always wanted to attend the TED talk and I was telling someone that um, I cannot um, afford the price. Um, and, uh, and he retorted back, um, did you, do you realize what is the price of not attending uh, a TED conference? And that really opened my eyes. It's a similar thing even with IAS preparation. Uh, some people uh, hold themselves back thinking that um, the cost of uh, IAS coaching uh, should they pay. But what they do not realize is what is the cost of them not taking IAS coaching? So um, what would be your response to that? No, absolutely. See, if you are super confident that you can handle all the subject, subjects, you don't need guidance, etc. No problem. See, for example, I never went to an academy. All I did was apply from Trivandrum to Brilliant Academy, Brilliant Tutorials, Masulamani Street, Chennai. And I used to get these bundles and bundles, which I could not keep pace with. 
But other than that, I was very confident that I could, uh, you know, read on my own. And that at those times, I'm talking about 93, 94, etc. Uh, you know, these academies were few and far between. If at all, you had to go to Delhi. But today, you have a number of academies. Uh, you have the internet also. So uh, the, the only problem is many of the academies are basically commercial. So it should not be like that, that you attend uh, academies that are very commercial, not based on herd mentality, but you should choose, pick and choose. You see, for example, Capstone AS Academy, uh, we have um, a very serious policy of uh, encouraging values, which no academy does. Uh, we inbuilt, try to inbuilt uh, into the curriculum itself, uh, concepts of integrity, not because we are supposed to take ethics, etc. So that's one. Second is uh, we help students who are, you know, COVID patients or, you know, COVID uh, orphans, etc. Uh, free education. So there are lots of stuff that we do even as a fledgling academy. Of course, we also require the money to keep trying to keep it going. But uh, students can get good guidance, especially uh, if it's an online academy. The advantage is you don't travel. You know, a couple of hours is gone in traveling. If you're traveling to an academy, a couple of hours is easily gone. Why do you want to waste money a time like that? And uh, time is the biggest of essence, I keep telling. So since you don't want to waste time, uh, and since you will have mentoring, one-to-one -one mentoring sessions with your people, especially IAS, IPS officers who succeeded um, and quit for different reasons, I think uh, it will add a lot of value to you. See, for example, yesterday when Mira called me, I felt really happy because, you know, she said, said that one interview made a lot of difference because I was not feeling confident. But the interview uh, led by Mr. Madhavan Nambiar, you know, Mr. Madhavan Nambiar was the Secretary of Civil Aviation. He was the chairman. I was the, uh, then four, three of us were there. And, uh, you know, we asked very, very, uh, you know, penetrating questions. And she was able to do it because nobody, she said she attended many academies. But this was an academy which made a difference. This was the mock interview which made a huge difference. And one day before the interview, she called me and, uh, you know, uh, uh, talked to me. And actually also she called me. So the point I'm trying to say is that, are you attending an academy uh, which is uh, talking about world-class excellence, you know, that those kinds of things, or are you interested in going to fly-by-night operators? So this is the one distinction you need to make but if you're going to a good academy, it's always helpful. Excellent. Uh, we have time for one last question, Dr. Santosh. And uh, that is, um, you um, are an, it's on a, it's a light question, a lighthearted question as to end. Um, you're an excellent singer. You, you have picked up learning to play the guitar. Um, how important is it for a professional to have a hobby or a side interest to become a better leader, to become a better professional? No, thank you for that. In fact, UPSC expects this. So hobby is a major thing that is, you know, basically the DAF, the detail application form is uh, the form from which the questions, you know, the, the people sitting on the board decide what questions they're going to ask. So hobby is one of them. And, um, you know, it's very important. And we keep telling candidates that you just don't say, I'm interested in reading. Just be a lot more nuanced. I'm interested in reading fiction, this, or, you know, I'm interested in music. You know, sometimes people are asked to sing. People have been asked to dance also. Uh, in any case, you have to dance to tunes of somebody, right? But uh, the point is that uh, for a well-rounded personality, all these arts will be very useful. That's why I would encourage parents to take your children to music sessions for painting, whatever, you know, everybody has some talent. Help unleash those talents. If, uh, and, uh, you know, if it's just pure nerd who's interested in really reading, if that will not serve, you need a person who is a uh, uh, jack of all trades. Uh, that's what I would see. Uh, he can be a master of administration because the administration is so wide, but, you know, when you are a jack of all trades, you know how to handle people because it's about people management. And you are dealing with A person, B person, C person, D person. Each person is different. We are not like pen bins, right? So when you have to deal with a group, a, a, an organization, etc., you need to with the, deal with the individuals. So if you are a, a well-rounded personality with all this, the sense of humor or, you know, music, all this will be extremely useful. And I'm a person who used to conduct orchestras. You know, when I did it as a collector, it was a big revelation. My district judge was a flutist. My tassildar was the synthesizer player. 
the warden in the prison was the tabla player and you know 2500 people came to witness all of us in action it it created a different idea about the bureaucracy itself that you know these people are also talented and we didn't know uh, if the judge can play the flute etc and uh, when i was uh, principal secretary it we had sports day we had music day and uh, it was uh, it was attended by almost uh, 1800 people so the point i'm trying to say is that it it lightens the mood if you are in a tough situation many of these officers uh, who are capable of you know who have these talents etc would be in a better position to handle that situation you see the army men and all you know the um, they 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 impress in music they impress in dance that's how they lighten the tension that's building up thank you so much dr santosh um and uh, on that note we draw uh, this week's ama ask me anything with dr santosh babu to a close uh, please keep in mind please mark your calendars for 2 pm every sunday week on week it's an opportunity for you to interact with dr santosh and an opportunity for you to ask any question that is holding you back from becoming from in preparing for your civil services or even uh, becoming a better professional on behalf of everyone dr santosh thank you once again thank you prabha thank you anmol thank you nisha thank you refak god bless